Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV2. This is what we have on offer for you tonight. Gordon Strachan says we should be looking at a Scott for national team manager. Graham Murty refuses to rule out more new faces at Rangers. Craig Levine has no regrets over natural order comment. Yeah, lots to talk about tonight in the company of Alan Ruff and our bookroom guest this Tuesday is former Celtic striker come midfielder Simon Don. They always like to throw in both positions yep. for him just in case he gets slightly miffed about it, Ruffy. No doubt about uh, your position on the programme, Ruffy, uh, as a goalkeeper. Um, as uh, both former uh, players at international level, um, now we have a situation where Michael O'Neill is no longer in the frame. We're now looking for a man other than Michael O'Neill. Um, the contenders, uh, there's not too many of them, Simon. No, I spoke about it last week. There was no kind of obvious contenders for me out with Michael O'Neill. I, I think the, the SFA had put all their eggs in one basket, anticipating Michael taking the job. Uh, it's not planned out that way, and you can almost hear them rattling about the, the offices at Hamden Park now to, to figure out what's next. Yeah, um, uh, there's quite a few people actually suggesting that maybe now we should be calling for the chief executive's head, Stuart Regan. Unfortunately, that's the, these things happen. You know, it's nearly four months now. I think everybody thought there would be somebody in place before then, but as, as Simon said, when you go for one guy and you think you're going to get him, you know, then you have to go back to the blackboard. I would love to know, they're saying they're going to go back to the list, I would love to know the names that are on the list, you know, and then we could all get our head round to who the candidates are. I've said all along the one candidate's sitting there waiting, and it's Alec McLeish, you know, been there, done it, I'm sure the players would, would respect him when he goes in there, and... Uh, for me, he's, he's the man. Yeah, well, let's look at the reaction on the back pages of the morning papers to uh, mm. the Michael O'Neill uh, snub on Scotland. He decided to stay at uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, we are bombed out, but he's still bomb-proof. This is the Daily Record having a real go at the chief executive. There's also a little story about Jordan Rossiter, possibly Wigan interested, and the lost boy, Moussa Dembele. Could he be heading out in this transfer window? And there you have the Press and Journal. It's time to call McLeish. It's almost as if Ruffy's written that piece himself. Uh, and of those back <coughs> pages, uh, Stuart Regan coming under fire. Um, I, I'm kind of a trying to be a little bit more calm about it uh, on the basis, Simon, that he's gone for one manager. He said no. So get back on the list and, and, and try for someone else. And obviously, uh, you know, more than a few of us will be interested to know who is on that list and you know who is the current front runner here's a look at five that potentially have some odds uh, attached to them with regards to being in the running for the job and it's Alex McLeish at nine <coughs> to four Malky Mackay is three to one <coughs> then you have Slavin Bilic quoted at 20 to one Derek McInnes four to one and Steve Clark at 14 to 1. So you've already said McLeish, Simon. Uh, is there anybody there or someone out of left <coughs> field that we maybe haven't thought of in the odds? I quite like Billich. I quite like the thought of Billich. Uh, I listened to the way he spoke about football in the, uh, as a, a commentator on the Euros. Uh, I thought he was very knowledgeable. He's been over the course with Croatia before, took them to, to finals. Ideally, you want a Scottish guy, but I don't see, out with McLeish and the experience there, I don't see anybody else there that will take the job. Malky, Stuart Regan already came out and ruled him out before even he, he, he took charge of that game against the Netherlands. Uh, McInnes has just committed himself to Aberdeen. The other one, maybe Stevie Clark at Kilmarnock, he's did really well. We have even mentioned Stevie Clark a few months ago, he's he went in and done fantastic things at Kilmarnock. Yeah. So that's why he's on the list there, but... I would, I would, something like Billich would excite me. Yeah, uh, strangely enough, I mean, there's no logic sometimes, I think, uh, to football and the suggestions that come forward. Picking up on the Steve Clark situation, you know, this was a guy that not, not, not too many of the clubs down south were bothering about him, uh, you know, at the tail end there. Kilmarnock, I thought, were, you know, really shrewd in getting him in. But it's a, it's a short term what he's done at Kilmarnock. I think he needs more of a period 
at Kilmarnock to see how he can reinvent himself again, Ruffy. I mean, he's slightly miffed at the way he was treated by a number of clubs down <laughs> south. You know, he, he really set the heather on fire at West Brom at one point, but I, I think this job needs somebody with experience. I mean, even if they go for Alex McLeish, they'll still get it in the neck off a number of pundits because they'll think, well, you're just, you know, you're going for the easy option now. No, oh, but I think uh, as far as Alex is concerned, as I said earlier, that uh, he's been there, he's done it, he knows the setup, uh, which is always important. You know, I think if you look at his record when he went in, it was uh, very good. Uh, Stevie Clark, you're right. You know, as Simon said, he must be doing something right with the amount of managers that took him as a number two. Big, big manager. So on the coaching side, I don't think there's any uh, problems there. I just think, I always feel that uh, a Scotland manager should should be somebody who's been it, done it. You know, and he walks into that dressing room, he gets the respect of the players that are there. Yeah, just on that point, I mean, we're talking about some people calling mm. for the chief executive's head. I think over a period of time <coughs> that he's been in charge, this next one is a big call. Uh, I think he's blundered his way through the Michael O'Neill situation and, as you said, maybe he put all his eggs in one basket. But the next one's such a big call because... If we don't get to the next major tournament, then I think people will see this look and say, well, you're not fit for purpose here. It's, it's a massive one for us, to be honest. Uh, the irony there is Ruffy's talking about a guy who's been over the... We, we had one in place in Gordon Strachan uh, and arguably had a, a fantastic run last six, seven games of that campaign, albeit we, we fell short. Uh, it's almost as if we do it back to front, you know, we, we then get rid of Gordon Strachan and, and, and we have no obvious replacement. Uh, it's a bit of a shambles. Yeah. The one thing I read this morning, Robbie, was quite interesting. It'll be interesting <coughs> to see if he does indeed get enticed by a club down south. But, you know, Michael O'Neill might be open. There was a suggestion he might be open to an offer of a club mm -hmm. job if the right one came up. Now, that would suggest to you that either he thought the Scotland job, the remit for it was something that was just mm -hmm. not acceptable to him or maybe the money wasn't mm -hmm. right for him. Well, I think the money was a, a hefty fee. It's a, a fantastic uh, fee on paper. But I think the biggest debate we had with Michael O'Neill was nobody knew what his preference was. Did he want to go back to club football? Or did he like the international setup? But I think he's probably waiting to see what kind of club we're talking about. You know, obviously the clubs that we're talking about that he could go to, maybe he doesn't fancy them. Maybe there is something on the horizon that we don't know about. But uh, certainly... It's a disappointment, but the good thing for the next Scotland manager coming in, at least he knows his salary. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I just wonder if they, well, you say he knows his salary, I just wonder if they have to crank it up even more to try and entice somebody, because it, yeah. if it's not one of the candidates we've mentioned there, and you know, maybe if you're looking for someone higher profile than that, <coughs> somewhere they need to find extra cash in the coffers, which yeah. I'm not too sure they have. Yeah, there's obviously something no been quite right there. I mean, I would, I would argue Scotland is a bigger job than the Northern Ireland job for me. Uh, I know they've qualified for the Euros and they were, they were very close to, to going to the World Cup and it just shows the job he's did there. But the fact that he came to speak to the SFA, I think he wanted the job and whatever's happened there, you know, all the boxes haven't been ticked in terms of maybe the control that he's going to have over the, the setup there. Uh, we can speculate about it, but obviously all the things weren't happy for him and he's decided to to give it a no. Yeah, okay. Uh, you can give us your thoughts on it at Peter and Ruffy on uh, Twitter and Facebook.com forward slash Peter and Ruffy. Uh, we're not too far away from uh, the kickoff of Patrick mm -hmm. Thistle against Celtic. We'll obviously get reaction to that on tomorrow night's programme. Uh, just briefly on it though, um, there seems to be uh, a fair bit of consternation uh, around Moussa Dembele. Has he been affected by all the transfer uh, talk? Y you just wonder if Celtic missed what I would call the peak of people being interested in a certain figure. You know, do you think that if he does want to go, that they can still get him out for a, for about 20 million plus? It's a, it's a funny one, football, you know, kind of striking, though, that the, the iron's hot. Uh, he was poor in the Rangers game for me. I watched the, I was at the game and uh, he looked as if his mind was in other things. Uh, whether he's been affected, he's still a young lad. I listened to Brendan Rodgers' post-match comments at the weekend and... For me, he didn't rule out a move in January, uh, if there's interest there. It's going to be interesting to see how it pans out. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the best of him mm -hmm. in the last three yeah. or four months, roughly, to be fair. No. Honest, we never mind the last couple of games. Yeah. No, he, he took the European campaign by storm, you know, and set a standard. I don't think he's 
he, he's reached. Since then, obviously, he had that injury, it was out for a wee while. I just don't think he's been playing enough. You know, I've said it numerous occasions. Simon might disagree with me. If I'm a striker, I want to be playing every week. Yeah. But if I'm a twenty million pound player, I want to be first choice. I want to be scoring goals and uh, and getting the rewards for it. But I think I think the fact that there's been inquiries means that people have phoned up and said, How much is this going to cost us? Yeah. And obviously that's what's upsetting him because he knows there's probably has been clubs have offered a particular fee but it's not suited what Celtic are looking for and that's why he's upset. Yeah, the Celtic fans will be slightly more upset if they sell him and then don't get somebody who's able to, you know, put a dent in Zenit St Petersburg. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's the big one now, you know, obviously Brendan's been saying all along that uh, can't compete with the teams in the Champions League but Celtic should be able to compete with the teams in the Europa uh, and that's what the Celtic supporters are waiting to see, you know, if the Celtic team can compete. Uh, that will rumble on and uh, for many Celtic fans they'll be hoping it's not right down to the wire with a left shot changed uh, anyway you can give us your views on that coming up after the break we're going to be talking about a cracking match, it's at Ibrox it's Rangers against Aberdeen Graham Murty's been talking about it uh, what sort of reception will the Don's boss Derek McInnes get when he goes back there after rejecting uh, the chance to become the Rangers manager. We'll hear from Graham Murty on some of his transfer dealings right after this quick break. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV2. Our guest tonight on Tuesday evening is former Celtic striker Simon Donnelly. He's alongside Alan Ruff. We've been talking about the Scotland situation, touching on Celtic. We'll get reaction tomorrow night on the programme to uh, Partick Thistle against Celtic at Fair Hill. Uh, as far as Wednesday's concern, looking ahead, there is a, a cracking game in prospect. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Going to nip along to see uh, some part of Rangers against Aberdeen Ruffy. Yeah, I think the, the Rangers supporters will be excited. Uh, they'll be excited after, obviously, the draw with Celtic. Uh, the amount of players that they've brought in, they'll, they'll want to see whatever one start the game. I don't think they'll all start, but uh, they'll get a chance to see new players on show and uh, then they'll decide you know, whether they're better than the ones that they had. I think they will be. I think on paper they, they're looking really good and I, they'll be hoping that they can turn it on sometime. Players take a wee while to settle in, but I think you'll be hoping tomorrow night that they can prove that uh, they're on the up. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you, what do you make of the players he's brought in? They've, they've got a bit of criticism <coughs> for the way they've gone about trying to get someone a permanent deal. The majority, in fact, most of them uh, on loan. Yeah. Still strengthens the side, though, Simon. Yeah, 100%. I think it improves Rangers easily. Uh, they've brought in, obviously, Murphy and Cummins, two players that have been over the the course in the Premier League before and been successful here and get moves on the back of it. Uh, Martin brings experience at the back for them. So I think it immediately improves Rangers. And I think, as Ruffy says, they'll be buoyant on the back of the performance at Celtic Park. I've tipped them to win this one, but I just look at Aberdeen's performance at the weekend. I think it's going to be a, a right good game. Yeah, um, as far as uh, Graham Murty's concerned, he's happy with the business. I'm pleased with the business that we've done. I think we talked earlier about um, attributes for players being um, conditional on whether we brought them in or not. I think the people that we've brought in have a hunger, a physicality, also be able to deal with the ball really well. But I've been really pleased with the impact they've had on training, on the squad, and they've worked really, really hard to make sure they integrate well, and I'm, I'm pleased with that aspect particularly. Well, I don't think uh, the board can be criticised for not backing him in the type of player that he wants mm -hmm. in there. He'll obviously been sitting down with Mark Allen and saying, OK, this is the type of player I want to strengthen this side. So uh, they've done it. Rangers fans have actually responded with half-term uh, season tickets as well, Ruffy. Yeah, and quite rightly so. I mean, we've already said, you know, the players have brought in have been an improvement for what was there. Uh, British players, you know, they'll know what it's all about. They'll know what it's like to pull on a Rangers jersey. You know, they'll be excited by it as well. And the January window is there for the supporters, you know, to get players in to to, to the anticipation of how it's going to turn out. And, and where, so, where Rangers were then and where they are now, you have to say they're in a better place. Yeah, uh, well, Jason Cummings uh, was certainly one that came out of the blue. He wasn't quite getting uh, a game at Nottingham Forest, so coming back to Scotland was a no-brainer in his mind. To be fair, he came in and um, he just said that um, I'm, I, I'm, no, I'm not sure if you're going to play as much games and if you 
if you do want to get more game time, you can look elsewhere. Um, it was, it was, when Rangers came in, it was it was kind of just a no-brainer. I had to I had to come here, so that's what kind of they pushed it for me to leave. So. Well, he's one of those players, uh, Ruffy, that when he's on his game, he can do something a wee bit special. Yeah, we've saw it. We've saw it on numerous occasions. Uh, he's a big-time player. He can come up with something special. I think his biggest problem is inconsistency. I think if you ask Neil Lennon, you know, the frustration of knowing what a player can do and uh, not living up to it on, on numerous occasions, and it's happened a few times, I think he needs to really cut the silliness out his, his makeup and concentrate what he's good at or he's on the park and, and scoring goals but uh, no, if he gets the supply you know uh, I'm sure he will score goals yeah are you a fan Simon? I am, I am I've seen what he can do it Hibs as I say gets his move to Forest and sometimes it happens you just it doesn't work out for you you know it's, it's, he's not had a lot of game time at Forest and he's get a hell of a chance here to come back and, and stake his claim you know because he's, he's obviously got a cap as well that will be still young enough to attract interest in the international front and I think he's got a good platform at Rangers. I think unlike the Cachinha signings that my argument would be a lot of the guys didn't know what it took to, to wear the Rangers jersey, I think this boy will handle it. You know, he's got that kind of gallus streak about him at Hibs. We've seen it, the cockiness that sometimes you need as a forward uh, and I think he'll do well. Yeah, well, I, I'm looking just some of the stats here. 23 goals for Hibs. Uh, is something that uh, you, you can't dismiss and he, he's got a chance to form a partnership with Alfredo Morelos as well, something that he's looking forward to. I'd love to play up with him. Um, I don't know what the, the gaffer's formation is. He, he sometimes likes playing two up front, so hopefully me and him can build up a good relationship and play up together. You know, I'm a, I'm a striker and I'm an out, out of finisher. That's what, that's what I do, so hopefully I can get back up front. Eh? Well, that's Jason Cummings, what about the opposition? Because Aberdeen will know only too well if Rangers win uh, tomorrow night at Ibrox, they will leapfrog them in the table. So there's a lot at stake here. This could be that pivotal moment psychologically in football. Uh, you look at certain games where you want to get one over on the opposition. I think Graham Murty will have a, uh, you know, I mean, a, a sense of superiority in this now because of what they've achieved against the Dons before. Yeah, yeah, but I think Aberdeen have obviously went there and, and got a result of late, uh, so that's kind of taken that monkey off the back. I looked, as I said, I, I fancied Rangers on the back of their acquisitions, but I think uh, I think Aberdeen's form at the weekend was really good. You know, they were tipped. That would be a difficult one for them. St Man, obviously leading the championship, they've kind of blown St Man away, and and Christie and Gary McKay Stephen looks as if he's hit a bit of form. Uh, they've got players that can go and hurt Rangers. Yeah, I mean, of course, I think getting Niall McGinn back was a great bit of business, mm -hmm. Ruffy. It's only one defeat in the last seven for the Dons. Yeah, they'll be confident in going there. Yeah, we all know what happened the last time when Derek wasn't there and they'll be looking for some kind of reaction. I think that midweek game, I think defensively, I think they were poor. Some of the goals they lost were, were pretty bad. So if they're solid at the back again, as Simon said, they definitely have players midfield and up front that can trouble Rangers. But so have Rangers. You know, Rangers are approved against Celtic, they're not going to sit back, uh, they're, they're going to go for that second place. Yeah, uh, I wonder if Aberdeen will respond because of the nature of uh, Rangers recruitment. I wonder if they'll respond before this window closes. I certainly would like to see them lose the likes of Scott McKenna. I think if he sticks with Aberdeen for a couple of years, he's, he's a better player than going to Hull City. Yeah, and I think I read that uh, they were interested in McGeoch as well, Aberdeen. Yeah. Although Lenny will obviously have something to say about that, trying to keep their better players. And Chris Cadden. Yeah, Chris Cadden as well at Murrow. Uh, I just feel Aberdeen have got a, a... I mean, Derek's built a really solid squad over the over the, the period of time he's been there. I agree with you, bringing McGinn back in is only going to strengthen him. I think a great bit of business with Kenny McLean as well. You know, loaning him back to Aberdeen to the end of the season. Uh, I certainly wish we did that at Dundee United <laughs> at one point. Uh, but that's a great move for them as well. It keeps the stability. He's been a big player for them. And it's going to be a, a really good race for the two. I think Hibs as well could be in there as well. So it'll be interesting to see who takes the second spot. Yeah, I don't know if you sense there, Ruffy. Could you still feel the pain from Simon on the, <laughs> on the Stuart Armstrong? It was just when I looked McKay's at that today, deal. I thought that's, that's the kind of deal that we needed at the time. But hey-ho. Yeah, it's strangely enough, it raises a, a number of questions right across the board across Europe. I wonder if they will address the loan system. Uh, Ruffy, when you think about some of the players, I mean, I think Chelsea last season had something like 30 players mm -hmm. on loan to other clubs, which I think is a ridiculous mm -hmm. situation. Uh, 
you know, you, you players want to play, but is there a limit? Should there be a cap mm. on it? Yeah, I think obviously some teams use it more than others. You know, I think if we're going to be promoting young players in the game, you know, bringing five or six lone players up, you know, obviously stunts these young players getting the game. And I think that's the biggest thing. Maybe we should cut it to three. We're used to three overage players, maybe three lone players per, per club, you know, and, and give the young players, uh, particularly we saw the Rangers young boys coming in and holding their own. You know, they're the kind of guys that are going to suffer if you bring other players in, and not just at Rangers, but other clubs as well. But, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly would limit it. I think it's getting a bit ridiculous. Yeah, I, I mean, the one good thing about it in, in the loan situation, for <coughs> example, Ryan Christie is playing really well at Aberdeen. Celtic will get the benefit of that because he's playing at a top level. Yeah. Lewis Morgan, um, Celtic will get the benefit of that because he's obviously going to get regular football at St Mirren. Yep. Um, I, I think once you start to go out and loan regularly, though, you start to lose your sense of yeah, belonging. I don't think it's uh, it's beneficial for your development at all. I think you talk about the, the 30 at Chelsea. I think they cast the net to try and get as many players in, but there's a lot of these boys will fall by the wayside. They'll not get a regular game somewhere. They'll go somewhere for maybe a month or two months and come back. I don't think it's ideal for their development. Ryan Christie's obviously went there for the full season. He'll regard himself as an Aberdeen player just now, you know, he's solely focused on that. And as you quite rightly say, I think that will benefit Celtic in the long run. Uh, but it's when you start going out for a month here or two or three months there, I don't think it works. Yeah, would you go for the cap? I would go for the cap, yeah. yeah. I would, I would actually go further and go for the cap in terms of five, six, seven homegrown players. I know we used to do it. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of clubs particularly down south, have lost their identity over the years and just bring in foreigners from everywhere. Yeah, so you're, you're predicting Rangers for the win uh, comfortably or close? I predicted them before I watched Aberdeen at the weekend. I think yeah. it's going to be a really a really tight <laughs> one. Yeah, don't worry about going on a U-turn here and don't, <laughs> and don't give us any of the it's going to be a really tight one. Give me a scoreline because you're now falling into roughy mode. I will go for Rangers to win 3-2. Three, two, five goals, that'll be sensational. Uh, Ruffy? Yeah, I'm going to go for goals, but uh, I'm going to go for a two-each draw. A two-each draw? Yeah. OK. Um, listen, I'm not going to knock you for it, Ruffy. A draw is a prediction. Um, uh, I really am looking forward to getting your thoughts, guys, on uh, the next part of the programme, because uh, if you're in Edinburgh, there's a real bit of what I call fantastic pub banter going on from the fallout uh, of that cup game at the weekend. Hearts... Uh, managed to knock Hibbs out of the cup by that goal just uh, maybe a few inches over the line. Clearly a goal for Hearts and uh, Don Cowie. And then Craig Levine comes out with the line, which I think has incensed more than a few fans and the manager of Hibernian. Of course, natural order has uh, been restored with Hearts getting the win. Do you agree with that? You can give us your thoughts at Peter and Ruffy on Twitter, facebook.com forward slash Peter and Ruffy. We're going to hear from the Hearts boss, Craig Levine, get his thoughts on how the team are playing as they get ready for another match tomorrow. And we'll also talk about Neil Lennon. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV2. Delighted that we've got uh, Simon Donnelly as our boot room guest on this uh, Tuesday evening. Don't forget that uh, Peter and Ruffy's Football Show on STV2, half past seven every night, Monday to Thursday. Uh, and of course, let's not also forget that on a Saturday afternoon, uh, we have the uh, Saturday Football Show at two o'clock. We'll keep you up to date with all four divisions in Scottish football and this Friday coming. Hopefully you'll join us on STV at uh, 8 o'clock, uh, right after Coronation Street, uh, our new Friday night programme. Ruffy, we're really looking forward to it. Um, Gordon Strachan's going to be our uh, special guest on the Friday. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to signing for STV mm -hmm. as well, Ruffy. It was a difficult deal. It would have been quicker had it not been for all the stipulations that you'd put into your contract. <laughs> yes, and uh, obviously the, the most disappointing bit of the whole thing is we have to give up Nation Street, because obviously we'll be preparing for the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know Len Fairclough's left it now, don't you? Yeah, I just thought I'd say God, God, it's the last time. I think that's about the last time I watched it. Uh, and for the benefit of uh, Simon, uh, Coronation Street is a soap opera. Yeah. Um, OK, on that uh, note, let's get back to uh, another soap opera in Edinburgh. This is turning yeah. into a, ma a magical wind-up in Edinburgh <clears> at the <throat> moment, Ruffy. Natural order restored. 
and uh, Neil Lennon's having none of it, and Hibs and Hearts mm -hmm. fans are, are just reveling in it. Yeah, we discussed it in both sets of fans. If you're a Hearts supporter, you're going to be overjoyed by what your manager just said. You know, and if you're a Hibs supporter, you're going to be waiting in the next game. You know, and that, that's what the Derby games are all about. Obviously, Neil Lennon is upset by the statement. Uh, you can see where he's coming from. But he's just won a game, you know, just won a game that they haven't won for, what is it, seven or eight? Uh, and, you know, he's taking the moment, you know, to slip, <laughs> slip one under the radar. Uh, but obviously, people have picked up on it. But uh, I'm sure in the next two or three weeks, uh, it'll be fo forgotten about it. But uh, it just makes the next Derby game a wee bit more exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, it's great for uh, yeah. everyone in the media. I mean, Craig Levine probably a little bit tongue-in-cheek with it. Yeah. Uh, I think <clears> there's a bit of hysteria this morning from some people with regards to his line. We love that sort of thing. That's what creates the banter. Yeah, for you guys it probably does, but I th I, I, you know, right after a game, I think I can yeah. see Lenny being emotional. The, the way the game finished, four minutes from the end, Hearts get the get the all important goal, and you know to come into the press conference just after that with emotions running high yeah. to be told what Craig had said. I think it's a, a natural reaction. I'm agreeing with Ruffy. I think you know uh, Lenny's comments were about normal service being resumed uh, with the two games to go. I think it'll be really interesting. I'll be, I'll be tuning in just probably to watch the dugouts rather than anything else. Yeah, that's what I love about you two. Killjoys when it comes to <laughs> looking for a line for the, for the written press or even the broadcast and radio as well. We love that sort of thing. Uh, of course, listen, Hibs have to bounce back from it. I, I, I agree with Neil Lennon. I thought it was really close, the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought the game was rotten as well, to be honest with you, Ruffy. But um, in the end... One little thing settled it in Hearts' favour. That gives them a huge <coughs> lift. Hibs now have to bounce back against the Dundee side with the only one defeat in the last five. Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, if any disappointment in Neil will have will be the consistency. You know, he would like to go on a wee run, maybe four or five games. You know, that he's got the players there. I see he's, he's now looking for a striker. It looks as if Anthony Strokes has... has played his part and uh, it'll be interesting to see who he goes for to bring in but I think that's a, the, the miss for him just now I think defensively they're very strong midfield they're creative up front they just need somebody who's going to score them maybe 15 goals between now and the end of the season if, if they can get somebody like that but uh, no you want you want to go on a wee one and run because We've already heard Neil saying he wants that second or third place. Yeah, it's an interesting battle. I mean, never mind the superiority in uh, the capital city, who's got the bragging rights, who's going to finish above who. Um, that's one <coughs> aspect of it. But, uh, you know, Hibs play a nice brand of football. It's easy on the eye. They've yeah. got threats. They've got service. Martin Boyle's been fantastic for them this season. Um, it, it, it's getting the right calibre of player in there to try and score the goals on a regular basis. Their problem earlier on in the season, Simon, was they could score one goal, they just couldn't get a second to kill teams off. Yeah, and I think that'll be the frustrating thing for Lenny. I think they're sitting fourth. I think they've only been defeated five times, but as you said, they're probably the best team, maybe out with Celtic, to have watched this season. I watched them at Celtic Park. They were really unlucky not to beat Celtic. Uh, I know Rangers went to Easter Road and won, but I think, again, that night, Hibs were the better team. Uh, in terms of football, they've been really pleasing on the eye this season. I think just the, the frustration for Lenny at this stage of the season, he's probably sitting there thinking they should be on more points. Uh, the important one now is obviously to get a striker in, because I think Stokes, despite all the problems that have been there, I think there's a quality player and could make a difference in a game. Uh, I know Lenny said at the weekend that he didn't feel the result uh, reflected on his absence, but I think that type of player being in the 11, you know, was capable of opening something up on the on the day, so I think he'll need to be replaced. But I wouldn't rule them out, you know, second place. I think they'll still have their eye on it. I know he will. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting fight with, with those three and possibly Hearts. Yeah, well, it's Hamilton Ackies against Hearts. Uh, no surprise, Craig Levine says he, he doesn't really have any regrets over uh, the statement, natural order restored in the capital. Maybe a little bit tongue-in-cheek. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that. Um, but he, he's quite happy with the way the team's playing at the moment. We don't talk about clean sheets or that at any point. Um, I don't want that to become the only focus for the team. Because if everybody's just thinking about defending, then we've, we've, we've got less chance of scoring goals. So, and that's the thing we need to improve on now. Uh, I thought we looked more potent on uh, on Sunday. Uh, I thought Stephen added a lot, and so did Demi. 
Uh, we won't get Kyle back, unfortunately, for this game, but um, I feel better about it, and uh, we might still do uh, some business before the, the window closes. Well, if we're talking about what uh, Hibs are going to do in the transfer market, I th you know, Craig Levine has also mentioned, as well as being happy with uh, certain aspects of the way they're playing, he wants to add some more faces. Yeah, I think if you ask any manager, they'll take as many players as possible. But, you know, but we, we go back to the discussion we were having there about young players in the game. That, that's two young Hearts players who have come in. Yeah. Cochrane, Randall, have done particularly well. If more experience come in from on loan or something like that, they'll be saying to themselves, look, we've done particularly well here. We want to stay in and keep going. But no, I think Hearts at this moment, any team who've went seven games without losing a goal, there's a confidence there. It means in dressing room before games, you're sitting there, you know your defence aren't going to concede. So you know you've got players in there, particularly with Naismith, who can nick a goal. And if you're going to be winning one nothing, you'll be quite happy with that. Well, I think he's. A, I mean, I just think he's a great signing. He's, his attitude is first class. If you're talking about, when you remember, uh, and we've been <coughs> discussing it over the last week, Simon, if you remember the players that influenced you, who were experienced professionals, uh, that gave you the impetus to, to, to work harder at your craft. Think yeah. about the benefits Stevie Naismith will offer those harsh youngsters. Yeah, and it just shows how professional he is because he lasted he lasted the game really well. Uh, he hasn't played a lot of football since August, so you know his fitness is there. He's a guy that looks after himself. But I watched him kind of talk the young lad Cochrane through certain uh, periods of the game on, on Sunday. And I think it's a really good signing for that point of view. I think the young boys there, I love to see the hearts guys playing the 16-year-olds and the 17, 18-year-olds, it's great for our future uh, in the Scottish game, but it's important that they've got experience round about them and Naismith, his experience will be invaluable to these young guys. Yeah, um, could Hearts actually provide us with maybe something a bit more positive in the central defensive area as well for Scotland? Yeah, well, I mean, Dare has already done it with Scotland, you know, the partnership, Suter obviously, even when he was up at Dundee United, he definitely looked like a centre-half for the future. Obviously, he picked up a bad injury as well. He was out for a wee while, but now he's, he's in. It's a partnership. You know, we used to have a partnership with Gary Caldwell and uh, who Steve McManus. Big McManus. Steve McManus. <laughs> yeah, and we slaughtered them, Ruffy. <laughs> well, they were well, the best, but they were, they, they were, when they played, they were, they were the best we had. Yeah. You know, that, uh, and they went out and gave their, gave their best. But uh, partnerships can be successful, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I just thought I'd remind you of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I do. Re we had Gary Cal Caldwell in the studio with Steve McManus uh, on another night as well. And, you know, we, we look back at certain times and absolutely annihilated them for centre-halves and, oh, how we would love that calibre I now. Think, I think you've got to give likes of John Suter a go. You know, he's, he's done really well uh, at Hearts. You know, he's come back for injury. He's made the position his own. I think we as a nation have to look to these guys to go and build a team. And it might not be for the next campaign. It might be for the following one. But yeah. develop a team. You know, don't come in with an EGR and pull somebody from down south. Go and give the young Scottish guys a, a chance here to develop. Yeah. It, it, it sounds, uh, you know, so sensible of you to say it might not be for this campaign. It's the next one. But I'm not <laughs> I'm not wearing that, Ruffy. We've been saying that line for 20 no. years. No, but we need it now, don't we? That's, that's, that's I think, the problem. Yeah. You know, we, we, we kind of, we just go from one to the next without having a, mm -hmm. a kind of, long-sighted view about it, you yeah. know, to try and build a team. Yeah, we did have that long-sighted view. It was called Think Tank 1 and Think Tank 2. <laughs> Unfortunately, great names. Uh, the, great the tank names. Uh, lost its track <laughs> and <Thank> uh, <laughs> we blew it. Uh, OK, I've got to get your thoughts then. Hamilton Ackies against uh, Hearts. Uh, not, not a good performance by Hamilton at the weekend. No. Uh, obviously losing a bad first goal, uh, put them on the back foot. But... Uh, no, I think Hearts will be confident in going there tomorrow and just getting a win by the odd goal. Yeah. One nothing. Yeah, one nothing. So. Oh, all right. Okay, Ruffy. <laughs> yeah, I agree with I think uh, I think they'll take a huge confidence for the, the Derby win at the, the weekend. I think they'll go there and it's a plastic pitch at Hamilton, it's never a great spectacle, but I think they'll do enough to win the game. Yeah, unbeaten in 10. Actually starting to their credit, Ruffy. We weren't too happy with the way they were playing. Just briefly, though, I think Hearts are starting to play better football. I was impressed with some of their passing, some of their passing at the weekend, starting to look as if they're gelling. No, I think when you're solid at the back, it means the midfield have got the confidence to go forward and support the, the strikers. And obviously, Naismith is a, is a big one, you know, but the, if they can start scoring more than one goal, you know, they'll, they'll be hard to beat.
Okay. Um, that's not always good when you hear Simon always agreeing with Rafi. It's just uh, <laughs> nauseating, to say the least. Uh, after the break, uh, I never thought I'd say this. We're going to talk about Ross County, who've signed a former Liverpool and Paris Saint-Germain player. <laughs> yeah, you heard it right. Uh, David Ngog for Ross County. We'll talk about that after the break. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on SDV2. Alan Ruff is alongside uh, Simon Donnelly and uh, Ruffy decided tonight uh, he was going to wear a white shirt uh, just so everybody can still see his tan from Mexico. That's fantastic. And uh, Simon and myself, uh, you don't get a tan when you're in Lanarkshire. It's as simple as that. There's, there's been no good weather for us. But Ruffy, you look, you're, you're looking great. You still feeling well? Yeah, I'm feeling okay, yeah. As I said, it's good to get a break. <laughs> it, was, it was a long season last year and uh, yeah. to get that wee winter break was good. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, a long season for you. I think three months and then a break again. <laughs> Simon. You know, he, likes, he likes his five yeah. holidays. He's got to have them yeah. as part of his contract. Um, you can join us, uh, STV2, every night, half past seven. And of course, our new programme uh, on STV, uh, eight o'clock this Friday, Gordon Strachan will be our special guest. I do hope you can join us uh, for the programme every Friday. We'll look ahead to the weekend's football in the SPFL, concentrating on the Premiership. And we'll bring you uh, interviews and no shortage of opinion as well. Uh, so... David Ngog, I never thought I would say this, Ruffy, but uh, a guy who was associated with Paris Saint-Germain and Liverpool, suddenly at 28 years of age, Owen Coyle's been able to bring him in at Paris, uh, I was going to say in at Paris Saint-Germain, in at Ross County, County, I beg your pardon. Yeah, well, we know that the owner always backs his manager, uh, particularly in January, and uh, he's obviously went for uh, a guy who's had a bit of quality. Yeah, you're taking, not gamble, but you're, you know what he can do, so you're hoping he can bring it. Uh, to the, the club, he's already brought the boy Eagles in, you know, who's done okay so far. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a manager shout, you know, but he'll be hoping he could maybe reignite some of the form that he obviously knows that he can do. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see whether it happened. Yeah, well, he's got him <coughs> on uh, a free transfer until the end of the season, which, I, I mean, Greek side uh, Panionios um, was where he was playing his football and things haven't worked out, own coils nipped in there. I just think, you know, if he can if he can show some of that form that, that we witnessed in a Liverpool jersey in fits and starts, um, at this level, he can yeah. be a great signing for them. Yeah, he's certainly got the pedigree, you know, Liverpool, Paris Saint-Germain, he's obviously got something, uh, and he's only 28. I think the connection obviously was at, at Bolton with uh, Coyley. He knows what he's getting with him, so it's not really a gamble. He's worked with the guy before, so I think it's a, a decent signing. Yeah, strangely enough, as you mentioned there, we're always aware of it. Every year on this programme, roughly in January, we look at Roy McGregor, who backs the manager. You know, he did it with Jim McIntyre as well on, on a number of occasions in the January window, which many a person will tell you is not always the best time to get players. But he brings in a clutch of players that somehow manages to keep Ross County just away from playoff and relegation, keeps them in the division. Yeah, it's worked uh, nearly every January. Uh, before it used to be seven or eight players coming in uh, in bulk. Yeah, that hasn't happened this time. So he's obviously a wee bit confident with some of the players that he's got and just maybe wants to add one or two. But uh, certainly, yeah, January window has always been the time when Ross County <laughs> seemed to pull themselves away for the danger of relegation. Yeah, well, they're at the bottom of the table at the moment, uh, Simon, and you're looking at you're saying to yourself, three points, the difference between them and themselves and Partick Thistle. Yeah. Uh, this is where <coughs> I think the next couple of weeks, uh, in fact, listen, the next week is key uh, to this whole process. You know, those signings could be the difference between being relegated. And as, uh, as we've witnessed with Inverness, sometimes it's a long road back in that championship. Yeah, but I think I think the bonus or the positive thing for Ross County and Partick is that they're not stranded. You know, you look at that table, I think there's only six points between Partick and sixth place. So it's not as if they've been cut adrift. Yeah. Obviously, it's not great. Speaking from experience, you know, playing and you're sitting second bottom or bottom. But as I say, they're not cut adrift. So I think they'll be focusing on that. Two or three wins and you're back up the table. Yeah, uh, we're talking about uh, a number of deals that will be done over the course of the next week, Ruffy. Jamie McDonald signing an extension at Kilmarnock, I think is a, a good bit of business mm -hmm. by Steve Clark. McDonald, for me, over the last couple of seasons, yeah. has really been 
one of the, the the key elements of Kelly, you know, staying in the division as well and doing so well. Yep, I, I was absolutely gobsmacked when uh, he was left out of the, the the team. You know, I think uh, the previous manager brought in an unloading goalkeeper and just dropped him immediately, and uh, couldn't see that coming at all. I, I, I would go as far as to say Jimmy McDonald has been up with Craig Gordon, possibly the best goalkeeper in the league. I think if you get a chance to see some of the saves that he's made, you know, crucial saves for Kilmarnock and, and won them points when they shouldn't have picked up anything. You know, for me, you know, I think he's had a fantastic six or seven months. Yep, great bit of business uh, by Kelly. Uh, let's concentrate on a number of other stories uh, that caught my eye. We were talking about it yesterday on the programme with Gordon Smith. Simon, I wonder which category you fall into with the, uh, <coughs> the VAR system because uh, I know that uh, IFAB are discussing it across the globe, bringing it in. It could be in for uh, the World Cup in Russia as well where the referees and the assistants are getting the video assistance as well to get the key decisions right. I'm for it. <clears throat> I think uh, last week we seen the, the good and bad of it, you know, in the, the English games. Uh, I think one goal was quite rightly ruled onside uh, and then they, for whatever reason, overlooked a penalty the, the following night. I can't remember the game. Uh, you only have to look back to the Edinburgh Derby before the one on Sunday there and there was a, a quite obvious goal that would have taken five seconds, you know, to identify that was a goal. I think between now and the World Cup, they'll hopefully have ironed out the little kind of mistakes. But there's so much riding on these games, particularly at World Cup finals. You know, if, if it's something like a goal or as important as that, why don't we stop the game and look back, you know, and, and get the, the right decision? Yeah, we're, we're very much in the embryonic stages of this mm. system, Ruffy. But Simon's just highlighted something which I think is the only area where you think, OK, it's positive. Referees will be able to make a decision, but the one thing that leaves it wide open is if the referee's interpretation is no, I'm not going to bother looking at the, yeah. the system and just let it run. Then you start to go down a, a, another dodgy avenue. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why a referee wouldn't want to look at it, take the pressure off them. You know, the, the, the game's so fast now, and referees have to make split second decisions. So I, I would take everything that was there for me, you know, to take the pressure off me, and I, I'm sure. Uh, if we move on, you know, and the big games come along, there, there'll be no chances taken. They'll be looking at the video evidence. Yeah, uh, there's one other aspect of it that it throws itself up because obviously people are saying, well, there's a time element involved here. Yeah. Not as m not as much time used as, <coughs> as a lot of people predicted. You know, yeah. we were talking about it as if it was the American football. Quick, go get me a you know a hot dog while this guy makes a decision. It's not been that long. If anything, it. It kind of highlights to me something that I, I've got a bugbear and I've mentioned to Ruffy. I, I personally think as soon as the ball's out of play or there's a decision made, you stop the, clock. stop the clock. No, I agree with you because I think if you time in 90 minutes how much the ball's in play, there's, there's a, a large period of it. It's not, you know, so I agree with you. I think we, we should do that. Uh, and then that gives you the time to go back and get the right decision. Uh, the, the Chelsea one was the penalty, wasn't it? it was, yeah. Uh, but why is the guy in his ear not saying that to him? Why is he not actually saying at the time, look, you need to look at that back? I, I take it there's a, there's a two-way thing there yes. with them. All you need for the, the guy in the, the studio that's looking at it on the teller to say, listen, you need, to, you need to have a look at that back. I think it's a penalty. And it's, it's solved. Yeah, I mean, that only debate is quite simply how often he has to get involved, Ruffy. Mm -hmm. And over and above that, if he's... If the decision is not being made and then he quickly looks at another angle and then mm -hmm. alerts the referee, that's why I think there's just a little time delay yeah. where you say, OK, wait a minute, stop the clock. No, I think if you ask any manager, the, the, the first thing they come out of is the big decisions. Yeah. You know, the, the really big ones, you know, the goals, yeah. you know, penalties, that kind of thing. I think if... Uh, the, the referees, I'm sure they are responsible enough to make these calls. OK, a couple of things before we finish. Uh, we're talking about deals, loan deals here and there in Scotland. Uh, down south, <coughs> uh, they're completing uh, multi-million pound deals. Uh, Alexis Sanchez, 400 grand a week, roughly seven and a half million pound signing on a year. But is he happy? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Mkhitaryan goes the other way. That's one deal done. I think the best deal of this window has just been completed by Manchester City. Kevin De Bruyne has signed a five-year deal. Yeah, fantastic player. And he's another player, you know, that uh, if you're a supporter of that club, your season ticket money is well worth it because he's absolutely wonderful. Some of the goals that he scores, top class. I mean, he does, he's the kind of player that doesn't score tap-ins. You know, it's 25-yard screamer into the top corner. 
and he, he's the kind of player who he, he's not like a like a big name player. He's not like he just does his job. He just does brings people into the game and obviously links up and scores goals. Yeah, and the last worrying point to finish on Simon, which I think is a worry for all of European football, uh, of the top thirty richest clubs in the world. 14 of them now come from the Premier League in England. These clubs have got more financial clout than anyone because of these lucrative TV deals across <coughs> uh, the world. Yep. Uh, Manchester United's turnover over 581 million. Eventually, you're going to see a complete change in who could potentially win tournaments. I think that will uh, annoy a lot of people across Europe. Yeah, you look at it and it used to be the kind of top six. You could probably say this season it's maybe even two or three, you know, the Manchester clubs and possibly Chelsea. Uh, I don't think it's great, you know, in terms of uh, competition. Uh, I said earlier on the show that I would like, you know, to have some sort of identity with clubs. I know it's not going to happen because of the commercial side of it, but I think you should always have five, six, seven homegrown players and bring in the so-called superstars to, to develop them. I think that's a problem with the English national team at the, the period, you know, there's not enough of the younger boys who have won in the 17s and 19s playing in the, the Premier League. Yeah, it's uh, going to be interesting to see how it all develops. I think once you get to the point where three or four English clubs are able to replicate what happened uh, less than a decade ago when they were in the semi-finals of the Champions League, then uh, a number of people will make rumblings. You can give us your thoughts on that. It's all about football, uh, north and south of the border, Monday to Thursday on STV2. And don't forget our new show on STV, 8 o'clock on Friday. Hopefully you can join us for that. Thanks to Simon Donnelly from Alan Ruff and myself. Good night.